Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the first event for the Ecologies of Social Justice Network, mm -hmm. which is a network created to bring people together that are interested in topics around environment, mm -hmm. uh, social justice, gender, race, political ecology, and uh, yeah, so we, this is our inaugural event, I guess, for 2017, and we have one other event scheduled that you'll hear about later on in the coming weeks. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that we are on the ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people, and I hope that our activities here today respond to our ethical and political obligations as uninvited guests on these lands. And I would like to introduce and thank our speaker today, Dr. Sarah Lee. And we're very fortunate to have you with us. Uh, before I introduce Sarah, I just want to say that I asked her if there was any kind of special something that I might be able to say when introducing her. And she let me know that she's going to be starting a postdoc here at UBC. So she'll be in our community very soon. <laughs> Uh, she'll be starting a fellowship in the School of Population and Public Health here at UBC. So I'm really excited because she has so much to offer and we'll be able to um, work with her and collaborate on various things over mm -hmm. the course of that time. Is it a two-year? Yep. Yeah, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment, um, Sarah is a research affiliate at the Center for Global Studies at the University of Victoria. She has a teaching appointment in the Department of Political Science and the School of Public Administration. And she's teaching some pretty neat classes. Uh, I'll only mention two because she's <laughs> teaching four, which is a lot. Um, she's teaching a course on environmental justice, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and also one on working in communities, mm -hmm. yeah. which is something we could all use more of uh, here at UBC. Uh, your PhD is in um, political science at the University of Ottawa. And uh, at the moment, I think you're working on some films around sustainability with communities. Um, and you also work a lot on arts-based mm -hmm. and uh, storytelling methodologies, another thing that we would love to have uh, mm -hmm. more understanding of here at UBC. So today, um, Sarah's gonna be speaking about, uh, or from her book, mm -hmm. Uh, everyday Exposure, Indigenous Mobilization and Environmental Justice in Canada's Chemical Valley. And this really strikes me as a pretty unique piece of work uh, mm -hmm. that works at the intersection of environmental justice and Indigenous studies, political ecology, um, and I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. So welcome, mm -hmm. let us all welcome Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Juanita, for the very warm welcome. Um, thank you all for coming and for being here today. Um, as a settler Canadian who grew up as an uninvited guest on and in Coast Salish territory, I appreciate the invitation and the privilege to speak with you today um, here on unceded Musqueam territory um, about the release of my recently published book um, with UBC Press. And if you're interested, I think there's a few copies in the back. Um, <laughs> just a shameless little plug. Um, and uh, and. This research took place in Anishinaabe territory um, in Ontario, and so I'll be um, guiding you through a bit of that research context and terrain today. Um, as I begin, I want to acknowledge my research partners from the Omdenong First Nation, from specifically the Environment Department, and without them, um, it wouldn't have been possible to do this uh, research, uh, and they certainly provide a lot of insight, support, and guidance throughout the entire um, process. Um, I would like to acknowledge a few of the photographers whose uh, brilliant images will illuminate my talk today, including Laurence Boutet-Rock and Aaron Vincent Elkheim, and both are members of the Boreal Collective, which is an international um, collective of um, documentary photographers who work on issues around social and environmental justice. Um, as I begin, I think it's also important to situate myself and how I came to research the experiences of a First Nations community living in the polluted heart of Chemical Valley. And I'm originally from the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I grew up in Belcara, BC on Burrard Inlet, not too far from here, um, on traditional and unceded Tsleil-Waututh territory. And though there wasn't a lot of interaction uh, between the settler community of Belcara 
uh, later as a graduate student at the University of Victoria, where I took courses in uh, political theory. Uh, and many of these courses were cross-listed with the Indigenous Governance Program. And I began to learn a lot more about the settler colonial context uh, in Canada, as well as Indigenous perspectives and values and, and ways of life. And when I was a doctoral student at the University of Ottawa, I watched a CBC film called The Disappearing Male. And this film featured women from the Amjanang Nation uh, and their reported uh, rate of declining male births in the community. And I wanted to learn more about why this was happening and how this could be happening in Canada. Uh, and I was very inspired and struck <coughs> by um, Indigenous women and their activism in the community. Um, around that time, it was in uh, the fall of 2010, I began a research position uh, with Dana Scott, who's affiliated with the Faculty of Law uh, at Osgoode, as well as the Faculty of Environmental Studies. And I took on a role as a research assistant, and part of my responsibilities involved liaising with her team and the Health and Environment Committee in the community and working with youth to support um, various creative photography projects to um, support creative avenues for defending their land and culture. Um, and although I, uh, uh, that project came to an end, I at that time started my um, formal PhD research uh, in the, I guess it would have been the winter of 2011. So in December of 2010, I was invited to a community sweat, and then in January 2011, I relocated to Anishinaabe territory from Ottawa, where I was previously living, um, and pursued my doctoral research informed um, by a participatory, community-engaged research approach. And so today I'm taking you with me on a bit of a journey to that place and to that time, and I'll explain my research to you. Um, and as mentioned, this is now uh, in a book format. And the book is really aiming to um, speak to a range of um, scholarship uh, in the field, the broad field of environmental justice. And it's something that I think we don't talk a lot about in Canada. Um, and one of my arguments is that that should change. And so I'm hoping that this is contributing to part of that um, dialogue and discussion around what exactly is environmental justice? What does it mean? What does it mean in a settler colonial Canadian context? Um, and so I think of myself somewhat as a political ecologist. Um, and so my teaching and research focus on these themes of environmental justice and public engagement and, and policy dialogue. Um, over the past three years, I've been affiliated with um, the Institute for Studies and Innovation and Community University Engagement, um, uh, which doesn't exist anymore, um, but it's uh, an institute that had focused on um, creating space for the reflection on engagement with communities. And so how best to work with communities is something that's been on my mind for a number of years. And also on my mind is uh, the language and rhetoric that we hear a lot around nation-to-nation -nation relationships. And this is something that our Prime Minister likes to talk about um, quite a bit. Um, and, you know, here we are. It's 20 years since the release of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, um, four years since the height of the Idle No More movement. And so I think it's a really important time to reflect on what exactly does that nation-to-nation -nation relationship mean. And as a settler um, Canadian working, uh, seeking to work in solidarity with Indigenous communities, um, who are facing some of these environmental injustices on a daily basis, um, I think reflecting on that settler colonial context um, and trying to think about how to move beyond that rhetoric of nation-to-nation -nation relationships and reconciliation um, is something that's on my mind and I'm hopeful that we'll engage with that during our discussion period uh, today. Um, so if I could draw your attention to the image on the screen here that I'm opening with, uh, here you see the glow of Chemical Valley at night. Um, and so this is taken from Highway 402, which um, leads you from, uh, starts from London uh, and then guides you over to Sarnia and then just over the Blue Water Bridge towards Port here on Michigan. Um, and so these lights are from a truck uh, whizzing by and then the glow is um, the natural glow from uh, the uh, Chemical Valley area there. And so I want to start with this image because it provides uh, kind of a haunting and affective sense of place and guides you into this region known as Chemical Valley. And part of my uh, intention today is to think about how can we breathe life uh, through an environmental justice lens that is rooted in the realities of, of everyday life and, and to create that sense of place. What is it like here in this context and in this setting? Um, so I want to share with you a bit about um, the context in this place um, for exactly uh, situating where the Amjanong uh, Nation is located. Um, 
tell you a little bit about the questions that were uh, motivating my research, how I approached those questions, what I found, and then where I hope that environmental justice uh, research goes within the community and beyond. Um, so at the outset, I want to mention a couple of paradoxes and, and problems that I encountered. And so first is that Chemical Valley itself um, is a paradox. It once graced the $10 bill in Canada and was hailed in a lot of political discourse as a very prosperous place. Um, and at the same time, it's a pollution hotspot. So it's home to Canada's densest concentration of chemical manufacturing in the country, and it surrounds the Amgenong uh, First Nation Reserve. Another paradox that I became aware of is the paradox of Indigenous research in the context of uh, Indigenous communities, um, as explained to me throughout my uh, interactions there, uh, experience a sense of fatigue with researchers coming in and out of the community. And there's this kind of uh, commodification or, or hyper-marketization uh, or um, complex, industrial complex around doing Indigenous research. And I was very uh, conscious of that and wanted to ensure that I was approaching um, this research in a way that would actually be somewhat mutually beneficial for, uh, for the community. Um, and so there are a lot of questions that came up in terms of how best can communities benefit from the research and not just me as a privileged academic coming in and, and taking knowledge away. Um, so there was a sort of paradox of, of research that I was aware of and, and wanting to work through. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions and talk more about that. Um, but the third paradox, which I want to focus on today, is a participatory paradox. And um, this became apparent uh, when I observed how policymakers were engaging members of the Amjanong First Nation, um, specifically regarding their health concerns and, and most specifically their reproductive health concerns. And so I began to wonder, do participatory or deliberative health studies or processes, like uh, the Lambton Community Health Study, um, which was designed to assess and evaluate um, the relationship between chemical manufacturing um, and the environmental health in Lambton County, uh, do they accommodate or do they marginalize citizens' lived experiences and claims? And I became quite critical of this process, and that's um, the bulk of what I evaluate and assess in the book. And so I soon discovered that these deliberative processes, um, which invite citizens in, um, in this case actually eclipsed citizens' lived experiences and eclipsed Indigenous knowledge. And I couldn't say it better than Christine Rogers, uh, who's a resident, a mother, and a member of the Environmental Health Department. And she refers to this process as the politics of dilution. And so uh, my book argues for conducting citizen engagement uh, in a way that respects Indigenous ways of knowing. And I present uh, an approach to environmental and reproductive justice, which I refer to as sensing policy. Um, and I think this offers three main contributions to the broader field of environmental justice. And um, first, uh, sensing policy that aims to operationalize intersectionality in practice by connecting it to policy um, through the process of community engagement. And it offers a critical reflection of um, some of the um, failures of policy in this specific instance. Uh, and second, in doing so, it seeks to reveal hidden or silenced uh, stories and um, seeks to bring some of these um, silent stories to life and, and honors and um, celebrates the process of storytelling as a way of transmitting and communicating knowledge and ideas um, for improved policy um, development. And this connects to um, the third contribution, which is trying to connect stories to policy. And I think that stories can really draw into focus citizens' lived experiences and the intimacies of their everyday lives. And stories represent diverse ways of knowing. And uh, I think policymakers need to find ways to treat stories as kinds of truths or evidence, um, which has been a difficult um, process, as I've observed so far. And I think that a lot of policymakers in, in the health field, um, which I looked at, really struggled with how to understand Indigenous knowledge. And so I see my research as trying to, to attempt to bridge a bit of a communication divide around ways of knowing. And so broadly speaking, sensing policy employs a relational, uh, engaged, prismatic, and multi-layered approach to public policy and environmental justice. So why root policy in stories? Um, so to begin a conversation about environmental justice, uh, I'd like to share this image of an eastern cottonwood tree um, with you, which is located on the Amjanong Reserve. And it's a powerful tree and was photographed by two photographers independently, um, first Aaron Vincent Elkheim and second Laurence Boutet-Rock. And I'm drawn to this tree, which appears on the book cover. 
And when I was finishing up the book manuscript, I presented a draft of chapter one to the Indigenous Studies uh, Research Group on campus at, at UVic. And my colleague, uh, Heidi Stark, said to me, Sarah, you have to start the book talking about the tree. You need to think more about this tree, go back to the community, uh, and, and start you know, talking to people about the tree. Um, so I went back to the community, and I took pictures uh, of the tree, and I shared them um, with different artists. And two immediately wrote poetry, um, which appears in the book with their consent to begin and conclude uh, the manuscript. Um, and then I rewrote the introduction, um, which I'll read for you just to give you a sense of how it begins. So it goes like this. Fighting for life, a large eastern cottonwood tree digs its roots deep into the earth. Branches outstretched, its arms spread wide, its trunk stands tall. Anchored, confident, resilient, day and night it breathes. Soaking in sunlight, giving back to the atmosphere. Dark reactions take place. Assimilating carbon into organic compounds, the tree exhales. Humans inhale. A reciprocal human, more than human dance ensues. Come spring, its veins sprout hope, transporting water and nutrients throughout the core of its being and into the air. Located a stone's throw from the Amjanong First Nations Band Office, the steadfast tree holds its ground. Adjacent to the community baseball field, a periodic source of pleasure and play, the tree stands alone. It rests meters away from the densest concentration of pollution in the country and quite possibly the world. Only a barbed wire fence separates it from the noxious neighbors across the street. Vast bulbous plumes of chemical effluent burst into the air, over the highway, and onto the community, engulfing the tree. This image is an accurate reminder of how life becomes compromised. Like the eastern cottonwood tree, citizens living here survive. Struggling to thrive, they fight back while defending their land, their culture, and their home. Like this tree, stories have roots. As numerous Anishinaabe scholars emphasize, stories are rooted in both the origins and the imaginings of what it means to be a participant in an ever-changing and vibrant culture and humanity. Stories provide a methodological and theoretical approach uh, to Anishinaabe scholarship. They embody ideas and systems that form the basis for law, values, and community. Thus, they are rich and complex creations that allow for the growth and vitality of diverse and disparate ways of understanding the world. Stories both haunt and heal. As my dear friend Lindsay Burrow says, when governments make decisions without stories, people suffer. So this book, book tells the story of a community fighting for environmental justice in an environmentally compromised setting, um, which impacts residents' entire way of life. So from my vantage point as a privileged academic who is committed to creative intersectional policy and to the overall aim of trying to work towards decolonizing scholarship, um, I tell the story through the images, poetry, voices, and documents, uh, and I express gratitude to all those who have shared um, their knowledge with me. And as a collection of stories that travel through time, this book aims to engage diverse knowledges, incite critical thought, and inspire reflection and creating space for dialogue about the tough matter of environmental and reproductive injustice in Canada's Chemical Valley is an ongoing concern. Indeed, the story is not over yet. Looking backward helps us to understand where we've come from so that we may better yet understand just how far we have yet to go. So that's how it begins, and uh, I'm really grateful um, to learn from recent scholarship in Indigenous law, notably um, some of my colleagues, um, John Burroughs and Val Napoleon, who speak uh, at length about the power of stories in, in law. Um, and I similarly am interested in thinking about stories and, and policy making. <laughs> so today I'm sharing with you a story about uh, Om Janong's experience in the Lambton Community Health Study in this deliberative health study process. Um, and this is what I focus on at length in chapter six of the book. But to start telling you this story, uh, I think it's important to, again, uh, share with you exactly where um, Om Janong is located and um, need to carefully situate ourselves in the community that we're talking about today. And so from, from the map, um, I guess both maps here, you can see how uh, Amjanong is uh, located next to the St. Clair River, uh, which separates um, Michigan from Ontario. Um, on, on the left here, um, the map shows you different chemical facilities, and this map was produced by EcoJustice. And it shows you how close uh, this concentration of facilities, uh, how, how close they are to the community. Uh, and it's just seven kilometers south of the city of Sarnia's core. Um, and then this map on the right um, gives you a sense of the, the wider territory of the community, which obviously transcends these colonial boundaries that we understand today. So I'd next like to show you another map that demonstrates um, the ongoing impacts of the community's ecosystems, health, and culture. 
so the Om Janong First Nation Environment Department uh, recently completed a traditional land use study um, and they provided consent to share uh, the map on the left. Uh, and so during this study, 14 elders uh, and other Om Janong First Nation land and resource users were interviewed over the course of four days. Um, the data from those interviews were collected on video and audio tapes and the locations of land and resource use identified by the interviewees um, overlaid uh, on this map here. And so the Environment Department staff asked questions about traditional life, such as fishing, medicinal plants, family values, habitats and species, important areas, previous land uses, and stories. And then these findings were used by the community to intervene against the proposed Line 9 pipeline reversal, which they argued could potentially lead to a crude spill, which would directly impact the lands and waters historically used by their community and would therefore carry with it a serious risk of severely impairing the current exercise of rights and traditional practices associated with those lands and waters. Um, so in their submission, they further noted that the Om Janong First Nations membership is severely impacted by ongoing industrial and refining operations located around the perimeter of their reserve. These sites continue to affect their quality of life and health. Further development of additional pipelines and facilities would contribute to the already significant negative cumulative effects on the reserve and traditional lands and waters and would further impair their ability to carry out traditional practices. And that notion of cumulative effects is really significant in terms of policy and the lack of consideration of cumulative effects in environmental um, law and planning, specifically in Ontario and, and for other jurisdictions as well. Uh, and then the map on the right is a combination of these uh, maps that appears in the book. Um, and, and Ken Josephson, um, based at the University of Victoria, assisted me with this map in combining some of the data from Om Janong staff as well as the eco-justice data to give you a sense of um, the, the sort of multi-layered impacts um, that are um, affecting the community in terms of their geographic and geopolitical location here in the middle of Chemical Valley. Um, so these images, um, the one on the right is a little bit dark, but they show you the impact of one facility in particular, the impact of Suncor on um, the community and their location. And so Suncor was um, the named respondent uh, in the notice of application for judicial review by EcoJustice on behalf of two individuals from Om Janong, Ron Plain, and Leda, Ada Lockridge in 2010. And as you can see here, um, Sun Suncor affects the community in, uh, in, in day and night at all times, and it's not a place where uh, members of the community can, can easily rest or rest in peace. Um, so on the left is an image um, from the, uh, the cemetery um, which is surrounded by um, these holding tanks and other facilities, um, as well as a junkyard and, and a highway. Uh, and then on, on the right, um, there's a, a home here, and it's lit up by um, Suncor at night. And so they, they have not only um, uh, pollution, um, but also noise pollution as well, affecting them. And so during my time in the community uh, as a participatory researcher. Um, I attended numerous community events and uh, I also attended uh, one time a funeral ceremony where the smokestacks and the reverberations and the flaring um, overwhelmed the sounds of drumming, prayer and song. Um, and so that um, you know, gives you a sense of how deeply effective this place is to the community. And the ways in which these facilities impact residents um, and affect their everyday life became the subject of several Environmental Commissioner of Ontario um, annual reports. And specifically, the 2013 and 2014 annual report noted the inequitable distribution of environmental harms and the impact of industry on the Om Janong First Nations' cultural, physical, and psychological health, um, which compromises their right to live in a healthy environment. And so according to this report, the commissioner noted, um, given their proximity to industrial facilities, the residents of Om Janong are heavily affected by Sarnia's air pollution. In addition to the permitted air emissions that occur on a daily basis, the community has experienced shelter-in-place advisories requiring residents to stay inside, seal air exchanges, and await further instructions. These advisories are issued when air quality is particularly bad, often due to a sudden release of chemicals to the outside environment, i.e. a spill. Residents report that the situation significantly affects their cultural life, including their ability to participate in hunting, fishing, medicine gathering, and ceremonial activities. This exposure may also have significant repercussions for the health of their community. 
The most recent annual report noted that the Ministry of Environment's review of existing uh, regulatory framework specific to pollution um, and Regulation 419.05, um, that uh, this specific regulation, which has to do with cumulative effects, will be reviewed um, this year. Uh, we're still waiting to see what that looks like. Um, so that's one possible change in terms of policy direction that the community is looking for, um, but it's moving at such a slow pace. Um, also in that uh, annual report, the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario noted that uh, residents like Ron and Ada are living in this kind of uh, context or climate of an environmental health crisis. So the question that I have then as a political ecologist interested in improving policy outcomes is how can uh, residents' lived experiences of this environmental health crisis inform and improve policy making? So this relates to um, some of the questions that, that motivated my uh, early days as a doctoral student here. Um, uh, first, let me just draw your attention to the, the chart. And this was produced in 2005 and published in the journal Environmental Health Perspectives. And it's uh, a graph that shows you um, the concerns around the decline in the rate of male births in the community. Um, so I was perplexed by what I saw in the CBC film called The Disappearing Male um, about a declining rate of male births in the community. Um, and these findings were produced uh, by a team of researchers uh, within the community uh, as well as external to the community. So it was a community-based project. Uh, and it was published in 2005. And the results of this publication um, perplexed policymakers at all levels of government. Um, so I set out to try to understand this controversy and to better understand how policies were, policy makers were responding and what the gaps in policy making were. So there are a few questions that, that motivated my research, which include um, how did Indigenous citizens mobilize to gain recognition of their environmental and reproductive health concerns <coughs> affecting their community? How do existing policies and processes respond to citizen concerns? And then what can we learn from citizens' lived experiences to improve public engagement and deliberative processes on matters of environmental justice? So as mentioned, I discovered a participatory paradox where citizens enter this deliberative arena. Um, they encounter structural and discursive fields of knowledge that, in this case, um, marginalize their claims. And I was informed by the work of uh, Michel Foucault, but also Chantal Mouffe, in trying to investigate the power dynamics at play that are embedded within this deliberative arena. And these participatory processes are neither seamless nor smooth, and they're laden with asymmetrical power relations, which I document in, in excruciating detail in the book. And my approach to environmental justice through the lens of sensing policy aims to draw our attention to gender and the citizens lived experiences and to try to think about how can we treat evidence and stories as credible forms of, of truth and how can these inform and improve policy processes. Um, <clears throat> so in 2005, the Amjanong First Nation completed a community health survey and though these these findings weren't published uh, in an academic journal. They were reported in a 2007 um, publication called Exposing Canada's Chemical Valley by the environmental law organization EcoJustice. Uh, and the birth ratio findings were published as mentioned in 2005, um, and this really confused and confounded policymakers. And in response, the local um, Lambton County Health Unit produced their own report, um, which um, obviously scaled away from the community's concerns to a wider um, population um, and showed no concerns around reproductive health. And that same year, the Lambton Community Health Study came into being. And so this is what I was really um, curious about was the Lambton Community Health Study and their process for engaging with Amjanong. And so for my research over a two-year period from 2010 to 2012, I attended health study open houses, um, reviewed online and survey data, and interviewed <coughs> board members as well as local, provincial, and federal policymakers and uh, community members of the Amjanong Nation. And within the Lambton Community Health Study, I found that there were four discursive fields of knowledge that um, served to discredit the lived experience of the community. Uh, and these four discursive fields include science, scale, lifestyle blame, and jurisdiction. I first want to just say a few things about my approach, and then I'll um, delve into each of those in a bit more detail. Um, so 
uh, the overall approach to this research was one of community engagement, and so far it was very participatory and collaborative in design. Uh, and, and for me, that meant trying to counter some of the conventional ways of doing uh, research and just being a parachute in researcher. Um, I've, I've heard uh, research referred to in many different terms, ranging from um, hit and run to helicopter to flashbang. Uh, and so I wanted to not be that kind of researcher. And so I was informed by the social justice lens, um, trying to think about how to work with communities um, in a way that would be uh, of mutual benefit and, and relevant to the ongoing concerns. And so I asked um, myself and my committee, uh, academically and my community committee as well, you know, how can researchers like myself, you know, independent privileged researchers, how can we do research in a, in a good way? Um, and so I uh, ended up relocating to the community for, I, I intended it to be one year and it ended up being two years as I stayed on to work on a film. Um, but during my initial time there, I shadowed activists like Ada Lockridge, who's pictured here, um, participated in community events, um, did some note taking, did some research papers and wrote a few briefing notes and, and um, tried to support local organizing and activism within the community. Um, all of my materials were vetted through a cultural advisory committee as well as the Amjanong Health and Environment Committee and Department and the Chief and Council. So there are all these layers of approvals as well as my own ethics board and academic committee back at the University of Ottawa. And I'm happy to chat more if you have any questions about the process. All right, so what went wrong with the Lambton Community Health Study? Why did it fail? So in 2005, um, the Federal Health Ministry, Health Canada, uh, met with local officials to determine how to respond to uh, Amjanong's reproductive health concerns. And early meetings really struggled with the scope, um, funding, and the board structure. Um, but those involved eventually identified a few phases for the health study. So the first phase uh, in 2008 was to develop a board structure. And this board included members of various stakeholders, groups uh, including municipal staff, um, the occupational health clinic workers, um, and members of surrounding First Nations communities. In 2010, a period of public engagement began during phase two. And this participatory process took place and included town hall meetings, um, a phone survey, and an online survey. Um, and phase three would have been actually conducting a health study, but um, that never transpired in this instance. Um, so in practice, um, science has become a mixed blessing for Amjanong. And, and pictured here is a body map which um, documents community data and community concerns around specific health ailments. And, um, this was a kind of science, a kind of citizen science, but it never quite translated into um, policy at the local level or, or even higher levels of government. And so part of my overall intention and, and aim in, in showing this and sharing it is that it should be treated as a kind of science or a kind of evidence and that policymakers struggle with how best to um, appreciate and understand communities' um, evidence that they're bringing forward about their own lived experiences and health concerns. So in this sense, science is a bit of a mixed blessing where you know, community members are engaging in practices of science, but um, science was overall used as a way of uh, disempowering their specific concerns, and I'll explain why that um, happened in a moment. And part of it related to um, the context where broader epidemiological methods um, disempowered or disengaged their, their site-specific um, health concerns. And this relates to the problem of scale and also um, reveals that problem of dilution that I referenced earlier. And so I don't necessarily think that we need to throw out science by any means, but we need to think really carefully about science and how best um, science can um, be of benefit to community um, as well as overall um, policy development. So the question that I have here is then, how can we make space for situated knowledge about community uh, community experiences and environmental health, um, and how can we make space in law and policy. Um, so with respect to scale and the politics of dilution that I mentioned, um, you might be wondering, you know, why did epidemiology fail the community? And, and in this case, it was um, the issue of, of scale here. So the sample size um, of the initial birth data collected was deemed by um, public officials as being too small, as being too small to generate any generalizable claim about environmental health in the community. 
And um, given this small um, scale, um, this is why uh, local public health officials responded with a widened out study initially. Um, so broadening away from um, Omjanong, uh, which has a population of about uh, 2,000 members, half of which live on reserve. Um, so widening out to the Lambton population, which is about 120,000, um, it tended to dilute the specific concerns that were coming out of Omjanong. So this was a problem of, of scale and sample size. And so the scope of the study moved away um, from, from the Omjanong Nation all the way out to Lambton County. And then during the deliberations of these um, town hall meetings and board meetings around the Lambton Community Health Study, often board members spoke about um, widening out even further to the Ontario Health Study, which is a vo voluntary study where you would sort of call in your own health data. Um, so it wasn't very spoke focused or, or targeted or specific to a specific geographical area. So a critical question emerges then, who's responsible for funding a health study if the concern originates in on-reserve um, Indigenous context? Um, and who's responsible for the issue of funding um, a health study when it includes both an Indigenous community and um, the, the wider um, county of, of Lambton in this case? And so according to public officials, um, this was an outstanding question and a conundrum and, and something that um, they really struggled with and couldn't um, couldn't come to agreement on. Um, another thing that uh, I want to mention here that, that struck me as um, uh, quite a common theme that I, I would hear formally and informally um, is the issue of lifestyle blame. So individuals being responsible for the adverse health outcomes that they were seeing. And this is what really um, bothered me. And whenever I think of the antagonist in the story, it's, it's, it's the, um, this I, the idea, the fictional idea that there's this heroic individual that can have perfect health while living in this polluted um, setting. And over and over again, you would hear this discourse about um, residents of the community being at fault for the health outcomes. And so the book is written against that, uh, that discursive frame. Um, and so I, sh I show this image here just to, to place the, an individual in context. You know, no matter how active and healthy one can be, you're still um, breathing in this polluted atmosphere day and night. And so I think it's um, quite problematic to assume that individuals carry the responsibility alone for the environmental health. And this is something that you see in a lot of um, health promotion policy um, documents and framing. And it also came up over and over again in my interviews. So then rather than framing individuals as at fault for their lifestyle choices, I think it's really crucial to look critically at the systemic conditions that are producing toxic environments um, that impact citizens' health and wellness. And researchers like myself have a responsibility to tackle the root causes of systems that marginalize people and marginalize health. And I think this is really key for social and environmental justice scholarship and community-engaged research, um, which is aimed towards a more social justice uh, orientation. And this more relational sensing approach that I'm advocating for tries to move away from lifestyle blame and places individuals in, in context here. But we're still left with the question of responsibility. Um, so further complicating matters are the apparent policy entanglements, including various authorities and different perspectives about science, knowledge, and expertise. And the problem of jurisdiction reveals the need for multi-level or multi-layered analyses of environmental health concerns, especially when they affect the vitality um, on reserve. And uh, this problem of jurisdiction has to do with the structure of um, Canada itself, and we can look back to the Constitution to thank for that, uh, with respect to the division of powers and um, this um, complicated arrangement where um, the federal government has assumed responsibility um, for the governance of Indigenous health, although it's a bit different in the BC context, uh, whereas the provinces have a primary responsibility for the environment. Um, however, when you bring health and the environment together in an on-reserve setting, um, this has led to a scenario um, which John Burroughs has referred to as being lost in legal limbo. And it does raise some questions about who is responsible for issues around um, contamination cleanup as well as funding a health study. So it's kind of this um, question that still lingers. And so as a result of this um, lingering question about responsibility and jurisdiction for environmental health in this context, uh, many community members find themselves struggling with how best to navigate um, Canada's colonial political system. 
So I'd like to show you an example in the words of Ada Lockridge, and she's a community activist, mother and, and citizen and resident of the Amjanang Nation. So this is her poem that I'd like to share with you, and it's uh, footage from a film called Indian Givers, um, which I worked on as a youth-led um, film production, and it's publicly available on YouTube if you want to watch it at your leisure another time. Um, just a warning and uh, caveat is that I'm showing you the most haunting part of the film, but it does end on a, a, on a brighter note, um, so just brace yourself for that. it over. There we are. I have an idea. Just, um, This is the mayor talking, but it'll segue into Ada in just a moment. I didn't know that we had a say on what goes on in the plant. I didn't know what was being released or how much of the mental health effects from it. I didn't know how to call the Ministry of Environment Bill Baxter Hotline to report any unusual smells or happenings and to ask for a copy of the incident report. I didn't know that when there was an evacuation that I should check the wind direction and know which plant it is so I can take the safest route away. Do not drive with the wind blowing at you. I didn't know that it wasn't safe to swim or play in the St. Clair River or the ponds or the ditches. I didn't know it wasn't safe to eat the fish or the deer or the rabbit. I didn't know that I should keep my window closed at night since the plants mostly burn from the stacks at night so as not to bother too many people or something like that. I didn't know which government is responsible for what. Chief and Council, Starting Mayor, St. Clair Township, Municipality, County, Provincial, Federal, Health Canada, Environment Canada, Department of Rules and Fisheries, Indian Affairs, Ministry of Environment, MP, MPP, Ministry of Natural Resources. I didn't know that those flares should only be burning when there is a problem. I didn't know that workers get some kind of slip when they have been exposed to the people. I didn't know how hard it is to collect pensions for the widows or disabled workers. I didn't know that when there is a power outage, why we get our power back on so fast, because we are in more danger when the plants don't have their power. I didn't know that the colors burning off the flares mean different substances are burning off. I didn't know that those beautiful colors of our sunrises and sunsets are due to the pollution and the chemicals. I didn't know that when Suncor was building their first flare stack that they were digging up human remains. I still don't know what they've done with it. I didn't know that these chemicals are used to make plastics, tubes in hospitals, makeup, battery, carpets, cooking pans, cleaning products, and so on. I didn't know that the same companies here make the medicines for cancers and other ailments. I didn't know that there were noise and vibration laws for these plants. I didn't know that some of the plants have native hiring policy. I didn't know that the plants self-report their releases. I didn't know that the plants can do pollution credit sharing or selling since they are allowed to release so much into the air. I didn't know that we sold the land so that industry could come to the area and create jobs. I didn't know that when the government had Indian agents here supposedly taking care of us that we were not allowed to have legal representation. I didn't know anything about the cumulative effect. I didn't know that these chemicals here can be passed on through generations. I didn't know that existing air monitors aren't set up to collect all samples that could be out there. I didn't know that the workers are scared to report things, fearing lost jobs. I didn't know that the workers have reported maintenance problems and they don't get fixed until they grow. I didn't know that the routine maintenance checks on holding tanks are only every 10 years. I didn't know that the riveted holding tanks are way out of date. I didn't know that these industries are still using some machinery from when they first came. I didn't know that there is a new law about pipelines being too close to home. I didn't know when the plants get fined that it goes to the municipality. I didn't know that the plants have to give out 1% of its profits to the surrounding I didn't know that the people in the one mile radius of Queen Harbors receive a yearly fee. I didn't know that <coughs> when the supplies are running out of that isn't dumb. I thought it came from Harbor Trees. I didn't know that the city of Sarnia police don't have money in the 
budget to provide proper gear for when there is roadblocks due to chemical release. I didn't know that the government works by the 4 Ds, deny, delay, provide, dispense. I didn't know that the medical doctors are not trained on how these chemicals react to the human body. I didn't know that they probably need oncologists, epidemiologists, toxicologists, meteorologists, and pathologists. All right. Um, so yeah, hopefully you'll have a chance to watch uh, more of the film if you're interested. It is available um, for free through YouTube as a public um, stream. Um, so I just want to say uh, two things and then move towards conclusion so we have uh, some time to chat today. And so um, just moving forward, I think that um, it's imperative to think about um, the vital connection between physical and cultural health and um, informing my analysis of sensing policy and environmental justice is also um, an acknowledgement of the great work um, done by Sister Song in the American context and also the Native Youth Sexual Health Network in a Canadian context and Elizabeth Hoover, who's an anthropologist at Brown. And uh, each of these... Um, associations and scholars um, speak about the inextricable connection between physical and cultural survival. And I think, again, this is illuminated well in the quote um, by a resident from Amjanong during the town hall meeting here, um, noting the connection between um, health, the environment, and uh, the future generations as well, and the importance of that um, ability to be able to not only just physically reproduce, but be able to reproduce culture. And I think that's um, a really critical understanding um, for environmental justice is bringing in that um, cultural component as well. Um, so one of uh, the, the, I guess, um, strategies or the ideas that I am most inspired by going forward is thinking about um, innovative communication. Um, so through different types of mixed media storytelling in order to uh, try to work towards some kind of justice, if that's the overall aim. Um, and I think that there are different opportunities to partner with communities and collaborate um, through using different um, um, techniques and um, trying to uh, interrogate mainstream narratives that uh, reproduce such harmful framing, um, for instance, like lifestyle blame, um, and then also try to uh, enhance dialogue with those who are most affected and, and ultimately try to intervene on some of those narratives um, and try to restore some kind of balance in how we're um, speaking about and, and framing these communities that are experiencing environmental injustices on a daily basis. Um, so just to conclude, one final example of a kind of um, narrative approach to environmental justice uh, I think can be found here in the words of um, Elder Mike Plain, who was one of my advisors, and he um, wrote a poem that corresponded with an image of the tree, um, and it's how I conclude the book, and it's how I'll conclude my talk today. I will continue to survive midst of toxic surroundings that touch my being, I will continue to survive. I still feel vibrant and full of life with contamination that invades my space. I still feel vibrant and full of life. I am strong and still all powerful. While money and greed so tries to uproot my existence, I am strong and still all powerful. I stand for inspiration, pride, and determination with minds bent on total destruction. I stand for inspiration, pride, and determination. 
más flexible. Okay, so I think that's where we'll end off. <laughs> We've got 10 minutes for discussion. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much, Sarah. I know that some of you need to leave. That's perfectly fine. But those of you who can stay, we would like to have, yeah, we have about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Or a question, do, would you like to just uh, take questions? Or sure. Do you need to? Yeah. Yeah, whatever is most comfortable. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think environmental racism is a very accurate term for what's happening, especially given the relationship between um, legislators and policymakers who have deliberately designed um, the geographic arrangement of Chemical Valley, for instance. And a lot of that has to do with the Indian Act and different changes and amendments and, and controversial land sales that took place since um, oil was first discovered in the area all the way up through till the Indian Act changed in the 60s. Um, so certainly environmental racism, I think, is an appropriate term. And some, some activists from the community um, use that term. Um, and I don't shy away from it, but I like the term environmental justice, maybe naively, but in terms of trying to, to work towards change and trying to um, think about how to um, amend policies and try to create space for um, community members' voices, and um, I, I think you could cr um, critique the justice framing somewhat for being um, optimistic and hopeful, but I think, I guess I found when I was living there um, that um, that a lot of the community members also used the language of environmental justice, and it kind of created that sense of community as, as if we were kind of working for something <coughs> together, and so I think it was that, that um, imp I don't like the word empowering, but that more... Um, that, that sense of agency that comes with the type of justice, for me it seemed more appropriate uh, in terms of um, trying to build and move towards something else, that kind of ongoing movement type um, way of thinking and being resonated for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did you treat the um, uh, data that you collected on the spatial utilization of resources that the community maps? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested in that in terms of trying to find out what are the pathways of exposure uh, mm -hmm. to chemicals on people? Mm -hmm. um, the pathways could be um, a reflection of their geographic location um, and about also their cultural behaviors in terms of the use of their uh, the natural resources. Um, uh, just like the, the tree that you showed, these people are rooted to a specific geographic location by their cultural values and their uh, identification with the land, mm -hmm. and the, their behaviors also make them be uh, more exposed or less um, by consumption of fish or by some other use. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is, how do you tackle the issue of the pathways of exposure regarding these different mm -hmm. things like that to help explain those two narratives of scale and uh, lifestyle? Mm -hmm. So most of that data was collected by community members themselves. So it wasn't necessarily me going and mapping that data. Um, the initial data um, on the map um, that has the location of the chemical refineries and how they're situated close to the community, that was gathered by EcoJustice. And the way that they collected that data was looking through looking at um, the National Pollutant Resource Inventory, so looking at national pollution inventories in the states and in the Canadian context. Um, and then mapping it onto the, the, the Google Earth data that you saw there. Mm -hmm. And then the other maps um, with respect to the traditional land use study, um, that was gathered by the community um, that they uh, did through their own interviewing and traditional land use studies. Um, and they did that in the lead up to um, their intervention around the Line 9 uh, reversal. Um, so I didn't actually do any of the, the data linking in that respect. That was um, done at the community level and at the... Um, Nonprofit or um, at the eco justice level, um, but I, I I think 
with that knowledge and with that data, I think communities and researchers and um, advocates can use this information to try to communicate more effectively with policymakers, for sure. The question is, uh, how do you go beyond communication to kind of meaningful um, influence to decision making and to, to policy development? And one of the really concrete changes that um, community members would like to see is um, changes uh, to the uh, way that the plants are permitted for their operations permits. Um, they currently don't have to account for cumulative effects. It's just kind of based on an individual um, facility basis. Um, and um, the health standards are not high enough for the community. So looking at benzene standards, and there's all these um, chemicals that aren't um, regulated at a, a rate that would satisfy what the communities are looking for. And a lot of this came up in um, the court case that took place when two members um, were seeking a judicial review um, of specifically the Ministry of Environment's approval and, and permitting of Suncor. Um, but uh, it raised all kinds of questions about cumulative effects and um, how the law could eventually be changed. But eventually that case was settled and it's not ongoing, um, which just happened uh, actually this past year. That's a recent thing. And uh, when I recently spoke, uh, with Ada, she mentioned some dis dissatisfaction about the case being settled, but I think um, it was feeling like a bit of a, a struggle. It was a long process. Um, they launched that initially in 2010. So after about seven years, I think they grew a little bit weary of, of going and presenting evidence that was thrown out all the time. And Dana Scott has written a really interesting paper, actually, about um, the evaluation and examination of evidence during that process and how um, Specifically, Ada's testimony was questioned. You know, is she an expert or not an expert? Even though she co-authored publications, um, her testimony was seen as not uh, a kind of expertise. Yeah. So it raises again questions around evidence and expertise and science. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for the talk. It was great. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more to sort of like your research methodology. It seems like you really cared about like uh, mm -hmm. being sort of accountable to community. So. How did you do sort of like on the front end thinking through that and uh, sort of when you actually got the community to pick, like did you call your advisor and yeah. your committee in the community, just if you could expand a little bit on mm -hmm. that. So. I think I picked my community advisor similar to how I picked my PhD supervisor, somebody that I um, was you know, inspired by and had common interests. And so um, my initial contact with the community was through Dana Scott as her research assistant. So I got to know the Health and Environment Committee well. And this committee, um, it changes in its composition every two years. Um, so I initially uh, picked somebody from the Health and Environment Committee, some, someone that I had met and had a good working relationship with. Um, so Mike Plain was initially on that committee, and he agreed to be my one of my mentors. And so um, he was somebody, um, as well as a few others, who had um, who expressed an interest in the environment. Um, and so I approached them individually and asked if they'd be willing to be sort of informal advisors to me. Um, and then I would share my questions and materials with them. Um, so that was, I guess, a, in some ways, a more informal role. And then in a formal context, um, I had a couple uh, members of the community Skype in to my proposal defense at the University of Ottawa. And so I was able to involve them in that process and the process of asking questions and um, ensuring my accountability and that my questions made sense. Um, and then once I had uh, my kind of methodology a little more refined, I went and presented in person to the Health and Environment Committee in Amjung, um, and then they approved it. And then it, um, the next level after that was to go to Chief and Council and present it. And it was a little more controversial at the Chief and Council um, level stage. There was quite a bit of discussion, but it eventually uh, received approval. And I think the reason it had approval is because uh, some of the advisors were with me. So Mike. For instance, he was there with me in the chambers when I was speaking about the uh, project. And so I think that showed some community support and interest for doing this research. Um, and they've had other uh, students and researchers come, come through the community. So I think that community in particular has certain protocols in place and, and expectations that they were able to explain to me too and what they expected from a researcher. So in that sense, it could be a fairly reciprocal relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Yeah, and local inquiry specific to this. Yeah. yeah. I know, I'm, I'm, I feel like that's like the unfinished piece of this work in the sense of how can it actually work in practice. Um, when I most recently visited the community, um, they were about to ramp up for some consultation around federal um, legislation um, for um, the governance of, of waterways and um, and so part of how the community um, envisioned starting to design their consultation approach was actually through a storytelling method, which um, they shared with me would be um, <clears throat> some of their um, staff interviewing um, community members and sharing stories about the water. And then they were going to share these stories with policymakers. Um, so I think that's an example of how the storytelling method can speak to policy, but it, it still leaves bigger questions in terms of um, again, how uh, can that lead to, to more than consultation? How can it actually be sort of informed consent uh, and the, you know the opportunity to say no? Um, but it also raises questions about um, actual resources for projects. Um, one local project that's taking place in the community that I think is um, somewhat encouraging is a return. Uh, Return the Landscape Project, um, which is a partnership between the Environment Department and an urban um, gardening um, association. And they're trying to bring, bring back traditional plants and restore the landscape in the community. And so there's some funding um, that the community has, has access to, to do that project. And it's one that's brought you know, um, employment opportunities to the community. It's brought, in, uh, it's brought back um, a sense of, of, of place and a sense of health and wellness. So I think there are these small um, projects taking place that, um, that can leverage different funding um, bodies to, to try to you know, restore the landscape and change the landscape on a really small scale. Um, but I think those really small scale, they don't necessarily change the bigger picture in terms of you know, the, the law uh, around, say, the, the provincial law around um, permitting of pollution. So I think that's why there's a need for um, you know, the sensing policy approach, in my view, includes uh, a multi-layered approach. So transformative change in terms of policy at all kind of levels of scale. So within the community, all the way up to the federal government, um, I think there needs to be more avenues for this storytelling approach in some way. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering about where Suncor was in all this. Like if Suncor has, like do they hire people from the community to do mm. consultation? Like is it just, yeah. you know, big rigs in New York and, and some local, like, or if there's racism within the community in terms of factory workers that are mostly non-Indigenous or how it plays out, just like mm -hmm. um, the messy parts. Yeah, totally. Um, they have their own communication staff and liaison people, and they do a lot of consultation. So I think from Suncor's perspective, not that I can speak on behalf of Suncor in any way, um, but my uh, my um, perspective or assumption is that um, they think that they're you know managing relationships and 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 they they are obligated to do some kind of consultation in terms of um, whenever they have to change their their permitting um, or expand their production. Um, some of the facilities, not Sunscor specifically, I'm not sure about their hiring policies, but some of them in the past have had um, intentional um, native hiring policies. Um, I think that practice has changed. Sort of the anecdotal um, experiences that I've heard about from, from Ada and others is that there, there are more kind of active hiring policies in the, around the 60s, um, but it's sort of declined since then. Um, there are different... Uh, projects like First Solar, for instance. So there are these new uh, energy developments and sometimes hi hire um, laborers for seasonal work um, from the community. So there, there are certainly community members that do work in the facilities. And um, throughout my interviews, a, a few of the residents that I spoke with um, had worked in, um, in the, in the refineries before. Um, but definitely not the majority. Um, and it's certainly a conflictual topic where um, some, some of those that I spoke with said, you know, I, I've worked in the plants and I, I'm grateful to have a job, but I'm still really concerned about my health. And that seemed to be sort of the, the bottom line um, or the, the main narrative that, that I would hear. Um, and 
Yeah, so I think a lot of people kind of accept that they might have to work, you know, in the plants, but just um, sadly, like, not like sleeping with the devil, but just kind of like, this is, this is what we need to do to make a living. Although there are some people that just wouldn't. Um, it, again, really varies uh, depending on who you talk to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My question is related to guns around yeah. labor unions mm -hmm. um, and whether there is uh, kind of political collaboration mm -hmm. between yeah, on the Latin Community Health Study, there was a representative, a union representative, who sat on the board and, and contributed to the overall um, structure of the board. In terms of activist type collaborations, you'd, I didn't encounter a lot throughout my research. Um, there have been different um, initiatives um, that kind of ebbed and flowed um, with respect to the union labor movement and um, working closely with um, Amjanong. Um, I can think of certain individuals who have definitely collaborated on particular um, events and initiatives. Um, the occupational um, clinic, the occupational health clinic for workers, historically they were a strong, um, I guess, ally or um, partner for um, the health and environment committee. Um, I think that relationship has changed a little bit depending on uh, different individuals who have been in these various roles. Um, but that has been a fairly strong relationship in terms of um, the initial uh, health study that came out that was published in Environmental Health Perspectives. Somebody from the Occupational um, Health Clinic of Workers um, was part of that study and worked really closely with the community to produce those results. So um, that's, that's one example of that kind of partnership. One other one that comes to mind, it's not specific to unions and labor necessarily, um, but it's still connected, is um, there's a group called the Victims of Chemical Valley, and so this is predominantly um, widows of workers who um, die due to mesothelioma in the plants. Um, and so uh, they had a representative on the London Community Health Study Board, um, which Ada um, sometimes would serve as in her role as vice chair. Um, so that was another um, point of connection that you saw between um, other, other groups um, beyond the indigenous community there. Seems to me that, uh, especially in the question of jurisdiction, there's a certain kind of just an environmental uh, issue or a health issue. It will go either to the federal or provincial government. Sometimes mm -hmm. these things seem to get kind of caught up in the kind of provincial um, processes and don't really kind of run out in a sense of a ongoing in perpetuity that kind of limbo we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's been a move to phrase it or frame it. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. So they, yeah, they signed treaties, yeah, pre-Confederation. Uh, yeah, you know, I didn't hear them use that language a lot in terms of um, treaties. It's a really good, yeah, good question. I know that the community is now trying to um, pass their own constitution. Um, so in that sense, they're trying to um, kind of uh, assert their own jurisdiction and, and push back on colonial con Canadian jurisdiction. So that's a, actually a very recent thing. And, and they've just um, done the first round uh, within the community um, to uh, start off their constitutional process uh, and, uh, and affirm that they want to create their own constitution. So I know that's something that, um, that they're starting now. And so I suspect we might see more of that kind of framing around law and the Anishinaabe constitution, um, Amjanong specific um, constitution, um, and how treaty comes into that. I'd actually be very curious to see. It's a good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Well, can you join me in thanking Sarah? Yeah, thank you. <laughs>